wants to get weird. Me. Me. <laughs> Me. Here we are. And again, we have a we have another special member of the of the mafia, the newly forming Weird Trick Mafia. Sarah, <laughs> do you want do you want to introduce yourself? Hi. Um, my name is Sarah Drasner. I am on the View Core team and a staff writer for CSS Tricks and um, a puppy mother and a stepmother and um, let's see what else. Yeah, I think that's it. That's I it. conferences sometimes. Sometimes you speak at conferences. So well, I've never had the, the opportunity to work with you on anything yet, but I've been following your work for a long time and yeah, I, like I was just saying, you're the first person to believe in me. <laughs> You've been following me since like follower, you know, 30. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't remember exactly the circumstances, but I just saw work you were doing and it was just this mix of kind of like raw tech and JavaScript and CSS and then some storytelling and artistry that I was just, I saw this as a, this is the thing. This is like the real thing, real deal. And and so it's been fun to to kind of watch that evolve. And and you're like, I don't even think you're you've reached your final form. Like you're gonna get <laughs> even more, even more crazy powers along the way. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm a curious person. That's probably the like I think like being curious and working hard are probably the two things that define me in tech. I just am curious about a lot of stuff, like how. Anytime I come across something, I'm like, how does that work? And then I <laughs> lose myself in that for a long time. So it's very easy to nerd swipe me. Um, <laughs> and people do fairly often <laughs> too. Um, so yeah, I think for, for me, tech is kind of wonderful because it's like, holy shit, people actually want to pay me to learn and teach these things. <laughs> so, how how did you first get into this world? Like where, where you, I, I know, me a little bit, but maybe kind of tell everyone like the little backstory. Sure. Uh, um, so I, um, I was a scientific illustrator at a naturally natural history museum. So I drew dead snakes and lizards for encyclopedias. And then um, they invented, so the reason why they do, they, they have people draw things um, is because a camera has an aperture. And so if you have something small, there's always going to be something that's fuzzy. You know, something's going to be crisp and something's not going to be crisp. But when you're drawing, you can actually make it look crisp at every level because it's you're holding it in your mind and, you know, recapturing it. So I use this kind of old ancient tool called a uh, camera lucida where you look through a microscope and you can actually see your hand mirrored over the paper. So you can do like really, really accurate drawings. And, um, and they- So when they, you're drawing, what are you looking at? You're looking at like a you're looking at the You're looking at the thing halfway and your hand halfway. So you, half of it is the microscope and half of it is your hand. And so you can see your hand over the thing. Oh, wow. So it's split and you're seeing one from one eye and the other, okay. Yeah, because usually what makes drawings inaccurate is that split second it takes to look from where you're looking to the paper. If you're good at draw, if you know how to make proportions correct, there's this split second, you've got to hold it in your mind from here to here. Even, th that's why artists don't like, they like they have it in movies where like the artist has like a paper over here and then they're like looking from here to here. We don't do that. You, you have to hold the, the paper as close to what you're seeing. So you're holding it in your mind for the smallest amount of time. So if you're literally not even looking from one to the other, you're not holding, none of your mental processes are, there's no cognitive leaks of like holding it. You're just literally looking at what you're drawing. So you're um, drawing snakes and then you're like CSS, baby, here, let's go. Actually, I'm not too much of a CSS person. I think people think that because I'm, I work for CSS tricks. I'm I, I, I was them. just kidding. Like you do JavaScript. Um, like but that. yeah, um, but I think, um, so, so they invented a camera that took pictures at every level. Like it took, like a crisp picture, crisp, 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 and then it composited it. So it was kind of like not employable anymore. <laughs> um, it's, it's, like, it's like automation put you out of work. Totally, totally. Um, and, but the, 
luckily the museum people really liked me. Like we really, I got along with my coworkers really well. So they were like, hey, like, can you make websites? And I said, yes, even though I couldn't. Um, but this was a while ago. This was when everything was like HTML tables and a little bit of inline JavaScript and CSS wasn't even, I think it was invented, but it hadn't even really caught on yet. Um, so I bought like a HTML for dummies book and taught myself how to code. Uh, I built like a, a few sites that weekend and um, and then there was a webmaster at the field museum and you know she she kind of I went over to work with her on the these like sites that they needed building and she she could kind of tell that I had didn't have that much experience <laughs> and so she taught me kind of like industry standard ways of of working she said that I reminded her of her so I think she like put more investment into me than she probably needed to. Um, but she, so, she, she opened the gate, basically. She opened she, the door. Yeah. yeah, she definitely was like super patient and a really good mentor. Um, and then I went and taught study abroad in the Greek islands for four years. And oh. they didn't pay me very well. <laughs> they pay me $10,000 a year, which is not a lot of money. And so <laughs> I made websites on the side for Stanford and UCSF and a few other oh, places. Nice. And Did you ever go to a, like, I think it's called CSS Zen Garden? It was a- uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't contribute or anything, but that was, I, that, that was around before I knew CSS. So I was like, whoa. <laughs> I, I, I don't contribute imagine. either, but it was like a nice place to like get inspiration for like what was possible. Yeah, no, it was, it's really great. Um, yeah. So then um, I came back to the States after four years of being away and I decided to get a job at an agency. And that was probably when I leveled up the most because that agency was really intense. Like you had to like clock out to go to the bathroom. You'd like, oh. they'd like time you for every task. So if I coded a newsletter in five minutes one day and seven minutes the next day, they'd be like, why was it different? And like, so like everything was like, go, go, go. And so I- That doesn't seem awesome. No, it was really hard and awful and just like a miserable existence, but <laughs> I got a lot better. <laughs> you, I mean, you just can't help but get much better in that environment when like everything is like, like that. It wasn't fun, but I did get a lot better. And eventually I was, I became lead there. And then, oh, that's cool. and then after that became, was lead at many other places and have been in the industry for like a decade past that. So, yeah. Yeah, I've also like worked at a few agencies. It's like, it's, it's a really cool experience in my opinion, as far as like doing a lot of different things. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, you definitely don't get bored because everything is a new task and like they, they'll just throw so much, like, it's funny because people like really think of people as being fancy and special if they work at big companies. But what I've noticed is if you're at a big company, you tend to get really specialized in whatever thing you do. And that small companies, sometimes people wear so many different hats and they're really good. Like, because they, there isn't like 17 other people to do every other thing. They have to learn like every piece of it. So um, their skill set ends up being really wide. So it's never really made sense to me that people like, think of big company thing as better engineer than little company thing. <laughs> no, totally. I definitely agree. Like, I also feel like I, I need to see it firsthand to like really like destroy that myth inside my head that was like the big company people, like they must know all this stuff because it's such a big company. It's like, no, like as startup, you actually wear like 20 different hats or like an agency, like anything that's a small number of people, like you're, you're having to do jobs that you never would have thought that you'd have to do before. And it's like way more fun for the people who like learning new things. Totally. I'm, I'm noticing I'm bouncing my head like what? Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Maybe it's to, Jesse, do you actually goes, agree with you? Like, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a psychological. Uh, so the, the, it goes even a step farther because you, you actually start abdicating understanding for those things that you don't specialize in. Right. And so, so then you, you might get more depth on that one thing, but you kind of lose all the rest of that context. 
Yeah. And actually consulting is really fun too, for that reason, because you're thrown into a bunch of different unique situations and you have to kind of like acclimate to different code bases really fast and like get the lay of the land. Like, like, okay, I'm just going to read this like a novel tonight and like figure this out. So, yeah. And then we, before, before we start recording, we were talking a little bit about the, the role you played, you, you did a bunch of management. So you had like engineering management and you felt the, the pressure of like having all these other, you know, human beings and, and like the outcome sort of rests on decisions uh, that ultimately rolled up to you. You were accountable, you're responsible. And then, and then sort of like how that ended up sort of basically being responsible for this other stuff that wasn't the work you're doing. And maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, totally. Um, I actually think that most people like know me for the work I was doing to like decompress from the work I was actually doing. So like, people get like are like surprised that I did this kind of engineering management stuff because they were they're so used to seeing me do like weird dumb code pen things or putting out articles or whatever. And that wasn't what I did for my day job at all. It was like, you know, for many years I was doing that this kind of like wow, like updating giant component libraries where if I messed one thing up, it messed things up for like 4,000 people. And it was like kind of just really like stressful. And so then I would go home on the weekends and be like, well, I'm going to make a huggy laser panda. <laughs> and like, you know, I just wanted to like code for fun and do something that was like more silly because it was just like everything at work was like kind of stressful and stuff. And, and the huggy laser panda just had to come out. Yeah, it, that's true. Yeah, the Huggy Laser Panda was laying dormant the whole time. <laughs> that's super dope. <laughs> I think, like, people tend to, like, uh, forget that, like, these people in very serious, like, high responsibility positions are also humans, you know? So it's nice to know that, like, you can bring out, like, your, you know, maybe less serious side. <laughs> yeah, and I think, like, what what's fun about it is that sometimes if you can teach through those silly things, then it makes it makes people want to learn it a little bit better. Like if I was trying to teach the same concept with something that like was kind of like my, not boring work stuff, but like everyone sees all the time. I don't think that anybody would really pay, like, it's like, oh, another one of those, like, oh, a to-do to list. Like not that, not that there's anything wrong to do with a to-do list, but you're probably going to remember a Huggy Laser Panda Factory more than a to-do list. No, no, one, no one can ever see the Huggy Laser Panda and forget it. <laughs> that, it's just uh, so there, there's another little thread that I don't know how how deep we want to pull on it but basically like there's so much work that gets done that's like invisible and mm -hmm. and, and and like uncredited and unrewarded right and, and you know that that's true of like a lot of different levels uh, of these organizations but I, I thought it was interesting you're know, like these are what people know me for but like this is what I actually did like most of my work and most of my time on and this yeah, is like well, go ahead Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say like, there's there's like this this pattern and it's not just um, people here, but like across industry, there's like so much stuff that if it doesn't happen, then everything falls apart, but, but no one really celebrates that work. Yeah, and I think it's because some of it you can't talk about or you can't talk about easily. Like, you know, some management stuff that you learn, like you, I've definitely had moments in management where I was like, oh, I learned a lesson here, but I can't really share that without, making the person who I'm mentoring uncomfortable or something like, you know, there's some piece of it that's like not like a, a thing that you can talk about super easily unless it's like many, many years later and it's a little easier to be anonymized. Like I would hate it if yeah, like, someone was managing me and then I saw that tweet about it or something like that would, that would <laughs> not be great. Yeah, so, like, you to protect the innocent. Yeah. <laughs> so in some ways, like the, like it's unfortunate because I feel like management, teaching and learning is one of the things this industry needs the most right now. Like yes. there's so many like poor management decisions that impact technology and people in technology, but like there's not, there's not, I see like technical article after technical article and not that many posts about that. Um, so yeah. there, there's a couple things floating around. I mean, Camille's books uh, definitely interesting and, and yeah, I just read Ben Horowitz's book, which, like, I was surprised that it was so good. Like, it was really good, actually, and very transparent. What's Ben Horowitz's book? Well, the, uh, uh, it's the hard thing about hard things. So it talks about, like, oh. all the hard things, like layoffs and, like, really intense things. 
Oh, cool. I should read that one. There's a couple other like Jenny or Jenny Zhu. Is that her name? Um, uh, the Making of a Manager. She wrote. Oh, nice. That just came out. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I want to. And Laura Hogan writes about management. Yeah. yeah absolutely. But there, there's an aspect of management that actually has an opportunity to evolve that hasn't. So we, we talk about these kind of new patterns in tech and, you know, we see them and they're obvious and they're concrete, but most of what people are managing by the dominant theory, and this, this is actually kind of dovetailing off of this agency that's measuring your time. I mean, that's basically like industrial revolution, Taylorism, management theory, just taken to the extreme. And when you're talking about technology and particularly knowledge work and, and bringing, you know, the creative uh, human potential to developing these experiences that are possible with software, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. And you, you actually don't get good results managing that way anyway. Yeah, totally. Uh, my husband, Dizzy, uh, it was VP of Eng at DigitalOcean. And I keep trying to ask him to make, write a book <laughs> because he has, he's really good with this stuff and the way that he thinks and talks about it is really, it's very intelligent and also like thinks about diff many different sides of an issue at once, which I think is very unique. Like sometimes people get stuck in like very Boolean thinking in our, um, in our industry. Um, but yeah, I just think that the more resources out there, the better, because a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of mistakes that I see made that seem so obvious or like just very like, like yeah. why is this happening? <laughs> I totally agree. I also think it's like, I think that what you said about seeing the bigger picture versus being like a bully and thinker, like that is what managers need to do. And the managers that cannot like take, take a step back and see all perspectives and then be like, with all this context and seeing all the perspectives, we should do this versus being like, you know what? No, this is the right answer. Like, yeah. 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 Not to like a on, on books, but there's a book called The Fifth Discipline. Has anyone read that? No. Uh, so this like old school or older kind of generation of systems thinking book, um, the author's Sengi, and he talks about a bunch, a bunch of things, but mo mostly about thinking in terms of systems. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the interesting lessons I took away from that is this notion of, of resistance versus, versus force. And that if you increase force, you're in, in increased resistance in, in most cases. And so like what, what he tries to do in both, or like gets you to think about is in, in most human endeavors and organizational endeavors, it's like, we just push harder, push harder, push harder, but you actually get more, you get more from trying to remove resistance. And, and you can think about that in terms of human behavior. Or you can also think about in terms of, you know, big picture markets or whatever. So finding ways to remove the resistance to humans doing the behavior, whether that's, you know, the customer experiencing your product or the engineers, you know, trying to deploy code, like all these things, are basically constantly, like we just push harder, push harder, push harder, and, and very rarely do we say like, oh, why why are we not you know removing the the brakes? Like let's let's take the brakes off. Well, I mean the why is a really big question. I think that if people aren't aligned with the why, that really affects productivity and it causes burnout. Like people often will just put burnout towards like working too much. And honestly, the work never really burns me out. I know that like working too much will burn you out, but like working too much doesn't usually isn't usually the cause of burnout for me the cause of burnout for me is when i'm not aligned with what i'm doing or like when i don't see the like when i'm like i don't understand why we're doing this and i'm also working hard that can really make me feel burnt out and then we also don't there are lessons that we've learned in technology that we don't apply to people not that we should always but like there's things where i've said to people like you have a single point of failure over here like that, that needs to be addressed. If you had a system with a single point of failure, you would address it, but you're not addressing this people problem with a single point of failure. Why is that? Like that, it's the same thing that happens with a system, with yeah. like a technical system. It falls it apart. Out, yeah, it turns out when you start reading about distributed systems and consistency and availability, like those, it doesn't actually talk about computers. It talks about, it, it's like nodes passing messages, mm -hmm. right? And, and so like the humans have the same, inconsistency problems right and so you're basically choosing to optimize for availability and doing work or consistency right and and like yeah. every time you have a meeting it's basically a write lock on your organization totally totally 
Yeah, and then like, you know, the way that people communicate and understanding what different modalities work for people. Like there's, I, like I have definitely said to like people who work for me, like, you know, I'm a fix it kind of person. If you come to me with a problem, I'm gonna try to fix it. But sometimes you want me to listen and not fix it and definitely tell me, <laughs> like feel free to be like, I just need you to listen right now because otherwise I'll be like up and running and trying to like fix things when people are like need more of a therapist kind of role, you know, like and both are totally valid. Sometimes you just need to vent about something and that makes you feel better. And then sometimes you need somebody to get in there. And like, so, you know, kind of talking about those modalities, that kind of like meta talking before you start managing can be, be really helpful too. So just to keep piling up books that people can read, <laughs> this related to this comment on burnout. So the, the comments you made are in line with a lot of the research and the sort of the, the most prominent research on burnout is this woman, uh, Christina Maslach who has a bunch of things, but the, the, there's a survey and a bunch of things about burnout. The Maslach burnout inventory assessment tests are interesting. And she has these six things about um, what causes burnout. And, and the, the number six one, which is basically what you said and also what I feel in my, in my soul is one of the major causes of burnout is that you're misaligned with the values of the organization, right? If you don't understand not just why, but like the point of it and, and like aligned with like whatever you think your purpose is as a human, then you tend to burn out. And, and you can do an immense amount of work and not burn out if you feel like you're aligned with the, with the goals. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I had someone ask me recently, like, do, like, why does that matter to you? And I'm like, well, because I have a short amount of time on the planet and I wanna know that the things that I'm making and building and investing my time in are meaningful and valuable to something you know, even if it's not the end goal, like I know that code is ephemeral and like whatever, I, like all the code that I've written for big companies has been written over by now probably. Um, but like, you know, you want to know that it's meaningful towards a future goal and that it's going to serve somebody somehow. Um, and that it's not just like, well, I don't know, they told us to, like that's just not a good enough reason for me, I feel like. Like I, did, I just feel like the, um, appeal to authority has never interested in me. You know, like some people like really get into the like, well, they're the VP, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I just don't care. Like, I don't care. Like we're all humans. Like it sort of goes back to the, the combat. <laughs> I feel like there's, like if you're trying to build software and you don't start with the premise that your, your developers are intelligent, you already lost. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, if you don't want their opinions, if you don't want to have their understanding of this domain applied to solving the problem, then, then you have, you're going to lose to someone who does. Well, and especially if you, if you can't explain the why <laughs> at all, then and it's like, that's, that yeah. <laughs> like, why are you in a role where you need to communicate if you literally cannot communicate a why? <laughs> like, it's like, ask me to communicate the why, like, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> hit a nerve. <laughs> I mean, the answer is because people are often rewarded for, for politics, not for competency. Yeah, and that's, I think that that's something we have to fix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, if we're going to make tech better for future ge generations, one thing that we have to work on is, is that kind of behavior and like the rewarding of, of that. Because the best ideas don't win out in that it's, you know, I think people talk about like meritocracy, which doesn't really exist, but like <laughs> um, the, you know, this like concept that the best idea will win out doesn't happen if it only, if only the loudest voices win and the most aggressive person like owns the room. So, you know, if you can't communicate a why, that usually signals to me that you're only working off of politics and that's not a good enough reason but sarah i said it louder <laughs> but i said it <laughs> i'm the vp <laughs> yeah that's like that's what that's honestly what kills me about a lot of these things although okay so what i liked about ben's book is it talks about how to know when you've created like an organization that is very politically driven and stuff like that but it's also very hard like in the book, like one of the hard things is knowing that your your organization is like that when all you do, all you have is the visibility of who comes to you, you know? Totally. 
Yeah, and I mean, I guess like in order to understand some of those pieces, if you're higher up, is to st still get some consensus lower down. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I think you, you know, this is borrowing from from Lean, obviously, it, it's it's not consensus. You you need awareness. You need situational awareness. Like I don't necessarily think consensus always gets you the best answer either. Yeah, but, well, consensus was probably the wrong word, but you do need to be like pinging little people. I mean, it's the, again, yeah. like in technology, you need to ping for the health of different parts of the system. You yeah, can't, so this comes, like, this goes from lean. I guess they're okay. <laughs> like, you know. The, the the lean the lean method is is basically like you you have to walk the gemba, right? Like you have to walk the floor. So that comes from manufacturing and manufacturing metaphors break down when you start really trying to apply them. But the the getting getting to the root of it, if you it, and this is also why I think leaders need to have some understanding of the technology, right? So we're we're also transitioning from a time when a lot of leadership in companies didn't didn't have technology background. And, and now you're seeing more and more of the Fortune 500 dominated by leaders that do have a technology background. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how that, that plays out. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm, you know, heartened by the fact that some people, that there's like friends and people around that are going into more management positions that I think are good humans and stuff. So seeing some of that stuff happens makes me makes me happy because I feel like, oh, okay, well, if people like that are in management, then maybe we have a shot. <laughs> so so we, we mentioned this kind of dichotomy and binary thing. And, and earlier when we were talking off air, I, I, I basically was kind of gushing about like how I think you're this amazing artist too. Like, so you like have this technology um, portfolio and, and, and then like expresses itself in ways, but there's also this art and then, and then you kind of like shied away from wanting to talk about that because it's like, Oh, well, you know, you're not allowed to be like these two things, right? Like you're not allowed to be technical and an artist. And I feel like there's a similar breakdown where it's like people, people have like an existential crisis, like transitioning to be a manager, right? They're like, Oh, like I want to be this technology person. And like, people are like, well, you could be a manager too. And then some people are like, sometimes the wrong people are like, yeah, I want to be the manager. And then, <laughs> Other people are like, like they end up in that role and maybe they're even doing a good job. But I feel like, you know, having had this conversation um, with myself and a lot of other people, you, you end up like this existential crisis. Like, who am I anymore? Like, I don't even, I don't even write code anymore. Right. And like, like you kind of have to understand what your trade-offs are. Yeah, for sure. And I, I mean, I think one thing is that, well, first of all, they are kind of different disciplines. So it's, it's tough to like go from, like you get to become such a good engineer. And I think there's like an old joke that's like, like you're such a good engineer that they're like, okay, now you're a baker. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> so it's like, you have to kind of learn this new concept and like how to do your job from scratch because this, as a lead, it's a little bit different. As a lead, you're still coding or you're still involved in, in coding and then all of a sudden when you go into management you kind of even though it seems like a very natural progression from one to the other it isn't quite because you're not as involved in code and you really shouldn't be at a certain level when you have a certain amount of direct reports beneath you that are trying to work your job is to be interrupted and not in a flow driven state like you you know you're supposed to be a force multiplier um, <laughs> Um, I think that involves um, some ego losing, like getting rid of your ego and understanding that your work might not be the most important work and that it, your most important work is helping other people work <laughs> instead. Totally. I agree with that. Like uh, I was talking to someone the other day and they were saying that like, you know, like running a company or like being a manager is like the hardest part is just the context switch. Like you context switch from like, you know, helping someone with their problem or like a problem that they're having with the team. And then you have to like context switch into actually doing something for the business. And then you context switch back into solving this problem and like context switch again. So it's, it is like being interrupted. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely interrupt driven for sure. And like, you're not celebrating your own successes the same way anymore. You're celebrating your team's successes. You're like, you're looking to make sure they're supported and that they're successful, not like that you're personally successful, which I think when I've 
seen bad managers in action, they're still driven by that personal success thing instead of the team success thing. Um, and that's when things kind of fall apart. How, how do you do that? How do you celebrate the team success? Well, I mean, first of all, just telling them they, they're doing well. <laughs> that one's pretty straightforward, but people do forget. Um, uh, to make sure that you're letting people know when they're doing a really good job, but also not overly telling them constantly so that it loses meaning. So that you're not like just fluff, kind of saying fluffy things that you say it when it's genuinely them doing a really good job. Um, I've really been super fortunate lately that where my team, like I've had teams where I had to like um, make them excited about the work because it wasn't very exciting. And so there were like, like my job was making everybody like nerd swiping them and like getting them into the task. And then recently I've had the, um, the kind of like fortune of having people work for me who are really, really driven. And it was weird because my job was then to make sure they weren't going to burn themselves out. <laughs> like I went from trying to like, Hey everybody, we can do this to like, Whoa. Okay. Slow down. Like, okay. Like let's make sure that you're not going to like, bust yourself on your own schedule and stuff like um it was like managing little mini me's and I was like oh my god this is what I get <laughs> so so but, it, was, it felt kind of funny calling them out because I'm like I do this too <laughs> so. like some ways that's actually harder like how do you how do you get people to do something you don't want them to do or, or change oh, yeah. I mean there's there I have a few different techniques um the one the one that I relied on kind of the most heavily was, <laughs> this is like kind of mean. Um, I would go like sit, so okay, I'll give an example. I, at this company that I were, used to work for, uh, every product had a team. And then there were like giant build systems that no one owned. And it was kind of like a hero's journey that pe people just had to work on it in whatever time they had. And like people from different teams would work on it. And it kind of sucked because if something really needed to be worked on, as a manager, you'd have to like incentivize people to work on it, but it was outside of their normal ag agile kind of schedule and their ticket system. So this one, <laughs> there was this one guy who was really, really good with this build in particular. And we were having this one issue and I came and sat with him and I was like, you know, it's weird. The system is doing this strange huh and he was like i don't i don't i don't have time to work on what why is it doing that <laughs> i'm like i'm not really sure and he's like i mean i don't really want to why why would it do that though <laughs> and, and then yeah, i'm like i'm you know yeah we're, we're all a little bit puzzled about it he's like okay <laughs> he like would work on it so that's that's one that's kind of you know, nerd well, you, nerd, you nerd swipe the guy, and then yeah, like, I nerd swiped him. Um, and, but it, but then, that works on then me. He wasn't, but was he going to be rewarded for that, right? Like you, I mean, in some ways, like the problem was already solved if you fixed the incentives so that people would own it, someone would own it. Yeah, that one was many more levels above my head where that wasn't really something that I could fix. Although I tried to fix it a couple of times. Um, and their solution was to try to say that it, my team would own it. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, this is, that's a, that's a different, that's different problem. Um, uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a, a couple of other ways to um, incentivize people. One of them is to make sure that they know that their work is really valuable and letting them know why. I mean, the why in the way is an incentive and a way of making people feel like you know, doing it is worthwhile. Like docs is one thing. Like when, when I was working at this one company, I would have my team update the docs when they knew that the docs were wrong if they touched that part of the docs. And at first they were grumbly about it because the other teams didn't have to do that. But then I started to incentivize it within our team that like, if we heard back from other teams that that part of the docs was really great, that everybody was like, we, we'd all like internally celebrate. So it became this kind of thing of pride within our team, that we were the ones who took good care of the docs. And a lot of other people really did appreciate it. Like you, we became known through a bunch of other parts of the company 
as like that was like something that they were really happy with and people would like high five them for it and stuff so, so there's, there's a value to these intangible rewards yeah so if you if you have a good why behind those things which you should um then you know you can align people with that or there's also you know the kind of normal you can take a couple of extra mental health days those kind of thing you know that that's kind of like this sloppier management thing but like the other i tried to lean more on the other two but then you can also do the like hey if you re i really appreciate it. i know that this deadline is really tough but if you get it in if we can work hard for this deadline i'll really appreciate it you could take a couple of days off and have a three-day weekend or something like that so like kind of balancing if i knew that there was a time that we had to like really be heads down working making sure that they had time to recover for from that because there are PMs and stuff that wouldn't have wanted it that way that were like upset that I was giving them time off to recover from it's like no we got them to work so hard we can get them to work so hard again like <laughs> um, um, so being a bit of a poop umbrella and I guess the other piece of that is not having them work hard and um, pushing back when it, things aren't right. Like if, if, they, if people are giving me too many tasks or people are giving me tasks that don't make sense, then pushing back before it even gets to them um, is another way of making sure that they feel like they're valued, like that they know that they're not having to do the work. They're, that They're protected because you're balancing their capacity against the demand from the, from the work. Yeah, and there's there's trust that's built in that, right? Like if they know that their manager is protecting them against work that sucks and is meaningless, then they trust me when I say, you know, this one is really important. You know, like yeah, yeah. You can't get that trust unless you show something for it. You know, so, sometimes they call it work for a reason, right? Like you got to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What you know with this with the career that you've had behind you and i'm sure there's gonna be some more stories going forward what, what sort of an advice you would give to someone because there's lots of people out there you know maybe maybe not drawing um pictures in museums but uh you know what what sort of a path or what, what would you what advice would you give to someone sort of listening or or thinking about tech to kind of make a make a name for themselves like where would they where would they start well um you know how i they asked me if I could build the website and I just said yes. Um, I think that that's a strategy to be honest. I mean, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of people who try to like gatekeep um, and say like, like it's kind of like what you were talking about with the binary thing. Like if you're this, you must be that. Or if you're this, you can, you know, the human brain actually isn't like that. They've disproven the right brain, left brain thing. Um, that's not actually a thing. Your brain, can, is capable of all sorts of stuff. And actually, if you think about very, what they found is kind of the opposite. If you think of very di different types of things, it actually allow, it's like the health, health of your synapses firing across your cor corpus callosum. So like the more different types of things that you think about, you are actually strengthening your brain. So what I would say is don't keep yourself from doing something because you don't think you could or, someone told you you can't or you know x y and z if you if something interests you just go for it <laughs> and see where did you, ever, did you ever think we 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 had this conversation about how like you got fascinated with computers but did you ever think it was hard oh like, yeah i mean I, art is hard computers are hard every, there's tons of things that are hard but um i think if you're really curious the hardness is kind of fun like there are part of parts of management that are not hard and not fun. I think even when computers are hard, they're still kind of fun. Like I just get like, I, I get to the point with like the flow driven state, which I love to be in. Like I just am the happiest probably when I'm in flow driven states that like I'll work for 15 hours and be like, oh, like someone will interrupt me and say something. And I'll be like, oh my God, I have to pee, I have to eat, I have to like, sleep. Like I just like have lost all <laughs> semblance of what's around me. So like, yeah, I, they're hard for sure. But it's sometimes the hard part is like, it's fun too. I I just had a few people get discouraged before because they feel like they don't know what they're doing and, and try and get them to this point where it's like, you have to realize that you're never going to know. And you have to be like able to embrace the fact that 
every time you learn something, you can do something else, but you're never going to know all of it. And, and no one actually knows. No, nobody knows all of it. Everybody and, learns something to get where they are. It's not like it just like came to you in your sleep. Like, yeah, I, I try to tell people like nobody was born knowing all of this. Like nobody was born with all of JavaScript in their mind. Like everyone started from zero, just the same. So there's nothing stopping from anyone from, you know. People just need to find their laser panda and then go make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no one started with Huggy Laser Pandas. We all had to make our own Huggy Laser Pandas. <laughs> That's why I feel like I learned the most. And it kind of connects back to this thread of why, where it's like, I have to make this thing exist. And like, I'm going to do everything until it does. Like, whatever it takes until it does, right? If, if, if it didn't need to exist, I wouldn't care, but it does. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just push through it until it does. Yeah, I think that curiosity part is really fun. I mean, it's fun talking to Jessie sometimes too, because like she doesn't, like for her, she's been working for in all of these things for so long. And I'll be like, Jessie, like, how did you do X? And she's just like, oh, well, if you just know how all of it works, then it's very clear that you. <laughs> no, but you have to learn. <laughs> it's not like, I mean, it's not if you just. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's like, like, because you know all of the pieces and, you know, you've, you've worked with each piece of it for so long and, like, know the ins and outs of it, then things do get easier, too, over time. Like, yeah, it's yeah. kind of like riding a bike or driving a car where, like, the first time you rode a bike, you had to think about everything you were doing all the time. Or, like, driving a car, you had to, like, think about, like, stick, like, first gear, second gear, and then you don't think about it anymore. Like, the... Uh, so this might be... Uh, it might be interesting, and, and it's, I think the characters in, in the on the episode make it even more interesting. But to me, like I, I feel like front end development is terrifying compared <laughs> to compared to like back end like database stuff. Um, and well, part of it's obviously they both have their. They both have their <laughs> <laughs> but like, like I feel like oh, you know, you can think about this thing, and like you understand like the latency of it or whatever, and like that's a system that is in my head. And then and then it's like trying to make something line up across every different browser and then like every different like mobile yeah. thing i'm just like just please kill me so yeah the test the testing matrix for front end is really high like it's just very non-deterministic <laughs> um i think it's gotten a little bit better like i used to have to test on like ie6 and stuff and that was just wow i mean wow <laughs> but i mean even for for front ends now it's kind of proliferated and scattered so that there's a lot of I mean, I'm really lucky that I learned things a long time ago because I can't imagine learning everything now all at once. I learned everything incrementally, right? Like I learned like this part and then this part and then this part and then this part because I could because that's how it came out. And now everybody, I mean, people get to skip some steps, which is nice. But, they don't but have to some, some steps, <laughs> but I'd argue like the human brain can only learn things incrementally. Mm -hmm. But like to make a site nowadays that's like modern JavaScript and stuff, you have to know a lot more pieces than I did when I first picked up that HTML for Dummies book. Um, well, more pieces exist now. So that's part of right. it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So like if people are watching this and starting out, I would say like people who you're looking up to probably learned it slower than you're learning now. So give yourself a break too. Yeah. <laughs> Find a why, give yourself some, you know, a break and then go for it. Totally. That's probably a good place to call it for the episode, right? <laughs> I had fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us too. You should come on again. Um, <laughs> more, to more, to more art. Make more art. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing it.